Hey, welcome back to the channel and a big welcome to all of our new subscribers. We really appreciate you. Please subscribe if you haven't. It's been a year now since I posted part one and since then I've done a lot of work to this whole Ford. I'm sure I've left some stuff out, but I hope you enjoy what I've put together. Let's get into it. And I do believe that cars have souls. All right, let's go under the hood. I was able to find a nice NOS, a new old stock water pump on eBay. The belts and hoses I picked up from the local O'Reilly's. Also ended up doing a few rounds of cleaning on the engine compartment. There were lots and lots of layers of crud to get through. My new pressure washer helped out a lot. After running the engine for a while, it was obvious that the valves needed some adjusting. There was one that made quite a bit of noise. You can listen to the before and after videos here. Can you hear the difference? I adjusted the valve latch to about 19 thousandths. I may go back in and adjust it down some more to 16 or so to make it a little quieter. Most of them weren't too bad. They were pretty even across the board. There was one that was way, way off and that was the source of the most noise, the clackety that you hear. I had a lot of challenges with the fuel pump. After getting one off of eBay and another one from O'Reilly's, none of them would work. My guess is the eccentric inside the engine won't actuate the lever on the pump. I ended up putting an electric pump on it to get it going. That may be why the truck was parked back in 1982. The air cleaner cleaned up really well. I discovered it was a factory cream color underneath all that grease and grime. There isn't much of the paint left now, but it's a nice color. After I was running good enough to take it around the block, I discovered the radio wasn't as good as I thought it was. It puked water out after the fourth trip, and so I ended up ordering an aluminum one to swap in. It was a direct bolt-in and works really well. While driving the panel around, I was only running off the battery since the charging system didn't work. In fact, none of the wiring on the truck works. The next addition would be to install a one-wire alternator. That would make things easy, then I could drive it further and not have to worry about the battery dying and getting stranded. I was able to modify the lower bracket for the generator and make it work for the alternator. I cut the back off of it, moved it forward about an inch, and drilled two new holes. The top bracket, which was an original, wouldn't work. It was too short. I asked around and a local friend had one that would fit. I took the measurements over and traded him out for one that was perfect. It also happened to be an OEM Ford piece as well. My measurements were slightly off and I had to add a spacer to the top, but hey, it works. With the new radiator and charging system in place, I needed to know what was going on with the engine. I ordered this setup off eBay and got them installed. I was honestly shocked to see the engine putting out 40 pounds of oil pressure. Wow. With the new radiator and thermostat in place, it ran a cool 160. Very happy to see both of those numbers. Here's a warning. Make sure your grounds are good or this could happen to you. On to the interior cleaning. Wow, this is the grossest car or truck I have ever owned. 38 years outside with the driver's window half down on an almond ranch. Lots of dirt, lots of animals made it their home. The smell was unbelievable and it had layers and layers of poop no joke i held a good 50 pounds of crap out of this thing i did wear a respirator don't want to contract no hantavirus in addition to the poop the wooden racks that were used inside the old bread truck were soaked in urine and stunk to high heaven it all had to go be thankful you can't smell this video this is one of the original bread boxes that came with the truck Kilpatrick's bread was out of the San Francisco Bay Area back then. They've since been absorbed into another larger company from what I was able to dig up on the old Google. I wanted to get the gauge cluster out and cleaned up. The only part that works is the speedometer right now. 
it comes out pretty easy. I mainly just did a lot of cleaning and then reassembled it. It'll make it easy for someone later on to pull out and add the new wiring into it. The steering wheel cleaned up really well too. Only some small cracks. It'll make it really easy to repair later on if somebody wants to restore it. Once I was able to get the cab cleaned well, it was time to get the floor looking good. That was a job for POR15. I've used this stuff many times over the years and it's a really great product. After cleaning out the bed area working down through the layers, I was shocked to see the original paint on the wood. I've never seen one this preserved before, but since all the wooded shelves were covering it up, it kept it in really nice condition. How cool is that? And you never know what you'll find. If I didn't have any sense before I began this project, I definitely have some now. Two quarters, one in 1940 and in 1954, a half dollar and an Indian nickel. Definitely the oldest coins I've found in all my years of playing with cars. The brakes. After pulling them all apart and checking the drums and the rest of the parts, let's just say not one single part in the brake system was usable. Many times you could just replace the wheel cylinders and replace the shoes. Well, not this time. All four drums were too far gone to be turned. The brake hardware was shot. Shoes were shot. All the hydraulics were shot. New plan for the brakes. After looking at the cost of replacement parts, it really wasn't that much more for a disc brake upgrade on the front. Those things are pretty cheap these days for the half ton trucks. I think this kit was $250 from Speedway Motors. I had to get the additional adapter for the dual reservoir master cylinder. I found this one online with an adjustable rod. While I ordered the disc brake kit and adapter online, I was able to get the rest of the parts from my local parts house. The new hydraulic clutch master cylinder and also the slave cylinder. Since they couldn't find me a new clutch hydraulic line, they worked with a local shop and had one made. It's now the shiniest part of the truck. With AN fittings on both ends and a braided line, my hydraulic clutch is working perfectly now. I also replaced all the hard lines on the truck from front to back. This also required a fair amount of cleaning and scraping of crud, but well worth it. For the last few years, I've been using a special paint called Cerakote. It goes on thin and dries to a matte finish. It's really durable and doesn't require a catalyst to cure. I painted all the brake parts with it. You can see them here. The disc brake kit comes with everything. Bearings, brackets, nuts, bolts, etc. Here I'm greasing and installing the bearings into the rotors. When they say these kits are bolt-on, they mean it. I had to do some slight grinding on the bottom of the calipers so the steering worked correctly, but it was pretty minor. Once all the hardware was in place, it was time to get the brake fluid in. The first thing I needed to do was bench bleed the master cylinder. You can do this on or off the car. I chose to install it and have a helper pump the pedal to work the brake fluid through it. First you need to install the tubes that pump the fluid through the master cylinder and back into the top. The whole goal here is to pump it until there isn't any air bubbles coming out. The pressure on the pedal should also be a lot firmer. A little slower. After you reconnect the hard lines and then you work from the furthest point back on the system, which would be the passenger rear, fill the system and then either push or pull the fluid out. I work by myself most of the time, so having a vacuum system works great. You just hook it up to the bleeder fitting on top of the wheel cylinder, crack it open and then pull the fluid through the system with a vacuum pump. Once you stop getting air, you close it off and go to the other side, then do the same up front. When you're all done, check for leaks. The only leak I had was on the proportioning valve, which was my own fault. I forgot to put thread sealer on it. I pulled it off, added some sealer, and uh, stopped the leak. The gas tank was one of the last things I worked on. I wasn't sure if it was even savable for a long time. I filled it up with vinegar and let it set for about a week to try to break up the solid mass inside. If you've ever wondered what happens to fuel after 38 years, it turns solid and it had about 4 inches of solid fuel in the bottom. 
Well, the vinegar helped. I used a lot of different items, including a pressure washer and a rubber mallet to try to break it all up. Once I had it cleaned as good as I could, I took it down to my local radiator shop and have them boil it out. They also double checked the seams and reinstalled the pickup that I had pulled out while removing it from the truck. This part for me was the funnest to work on and the most rewarding, like the engine bay and the interior. There was layers of junk on this thing. Pressure washing it was just the first step. Taking a tip from Derek over at Vice Grip Garage, I used the soapy SOS pads and scrubbed the whole thing from top to bottom. That really made a nice difference to the look of the truck. After that, I did a lot of buffing on it with some pretty aggressive polishing compound. The hood was its own challenge since there wasn't much paint left on it, or so it seemed. I used a few different methods to dig down into that, one of them being a wire wheel. The final polish was done like the rest of the truck, and in the end it all came out pretty well. Once all the polishing was done, I was able to install the new lenses that I'd picked up, as well as some good used door handles. The door handles it came with were pretty pitted, and I had to drill a hole through the driver's door to even get it to open. After sitting for 38 years, they needed some persuading. The front lenses were some new old stock that I found on eBay. The rear lenses, they don't reproduce those, so those were more challenging to source. I ended up finding them in a Facebook group for these old Fords. That's also where the door handles came from. People have this stuff lying around. Sometimes all you have to do is ask. What's next? Sadly, the truck isn't driving right now. I've waited for weeks to try to get everything dialed in so I can make one final video, but there will be a part three. I'm having a fuel supply issue, which I've narrowed down to the fuel tank. I need to pull it back out and see what's going on. It worked for well for many, many months, and now it's not. I guess there was something in there that wasn't cleaned out, and it's plugging the pickup. Once the tank's out and we can look inside, I'm sure the issue will show itself to us. Once that is sorted out, I will shoot some more footage of it driving around, and you'll get to see and hear the old truck. Thanks, everyone, for their support on this build, and a huge thanks to everyone who liked and commented on part one. I hope you got something out of this video. If I miss something, please ask in the comments, and I'll address it in part three. Also, please like and subscribe. Thanks again, and take care.